What's up, money lovers? Welcome back. Here today with a very special guest. We've got Tim from the YouTube channel Oracle Investments. Excited to have you here. Thanks for doing this. Excited to be here. Thank you so much. So uh, I guess we'll just jump right in here. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, I know you make a lot of content about Tesla. How'd you first get into investing in Tesla? What attracted you to the company? Well, I, it's stupid me. I'm, I'm like many people. I, I saw Tesla, gosh, at my job, like 2013. I mean, the thing was just, it, I was in awe of it. And I didn't, I wasn't in investing back then. So had I been in investing, I would have invested back then. And I would be in a totally different place right now, but I didn't. Um, so what ended up really getting me into it was, you know, seeing the stocks, I started getting into investing. New Tesla was one of the tops, but I knew it was volatile and it was expensive for me to first start getting in. And then my good friend who actually works for Apple uh, had suggested Tesla and he just told me all about it was so passionate, but he didn't tell me until after they split. I'm like, dude, I was like, where were you seven months ago? <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, but either way, you know, I'm happy to get in whenever getting in now is a great time to get in. And so, so I got into it right after he had mentioned that. And then the more I started to really follow Tesla and see what they were doing. And then when I started my own channel, you know, diving, diving in even further, my portfolio went from one share of Tesla to now it's like 55% of my portfolio. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think we're still in the early early innings here, so I think oh, yeah. you know ten years from now this will this will have been great prices to get in. Um, so so that was my next question. So you do have some other uh, investments. Tesla's your largest, I'm assuming. What else do you oh, have? Yeah. Uh, so I've also got actually I went down the list. A majority I've got like Square, Apple. Um, let me run down my list and see what I got here. I actually have my portfolio is in so many different places. I have to make a spreadsheet up to follow it all. Um, yeah, Apple, Disney, Enphase, Google, MP Materials is a big one I love going uh, into the future. Um, NVIDIA, QILD, SoFi, and Square. I've got some others that I'm trying to, to dump and get rid of too. Got it. But yeah, th those, those, are my, those are my top long-term holdings. I'm really looking, similar to like a Kathy Wood, I'm looking, you know, where are we going 10 years down the road? You know, what can I invest in now to get me to where I want to be in 10 years? Right. Yeah, those are all uh, great holdings, I think, to get you there. Um, yeah, Square, I, I used to own a few shares or block now, right? Uh, yes. I, I'm curious where they're going to go now with, you know, Jack Dorsey, given it his full focus, uh, stepping down as the Twitter CEO. I, I think oh, that's yeah. a very promising one, too. I'm, I'm kicking myself on that one. That was one I bought at 38. And then I sold out at like 45, just because I was just dabbling in the short term trading swing. So I made some money on it. And then of course the thing took off. I never got back into it. And then I, I bought back in, I think around 200, I've lowered my dollar cost average down to 184. So I'll probably yeah. buy a little bit more. I've been doing more um, fractional trading on that one uh, just because my cash reserves are getting low. But it's, it's, it's been tough. There's just, everything is like a screaming buy. And yeah, that's another one. I think what, maybe around 120, 130 now. It's just kind of yeah. got caught up in that broader growth sell-off. Um, oh, everything is bombed right now. So it's, yeah. Um, so with Tesla, I mean, do you have any predictions? Where do you see this company going and the, the stock price or the company itself in, you know, 2022, five years from now, 10 years from now? What do you oh, think? Geez. So, and I don't know if you heard already, uh, looks like we are getting approval for Berlin uh, later this week, Thursday or Friday. So we yeah, should be getting opening up then. Uh, grand opening should be on the 23rd. And then we've got Austin. So you know, these are things, obviously, they're delayed. We knew that they were coming, though. So how much of that's priced in? I'm not sure. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, looking at this year, so much still uncertainty going on over the next month. And so I'm still holding to my price target end of the year of 1969. Uh, we'll see if that's going to actually play out. Uh, obviously, the next month is going to make a huge difference. You know, how is Russia, Ukraine going to play out? They're going through there. There are peace talks right now. I don't think they're going to get anywhere, but we'll see what happens. Um, then we've got the interest rates going up in the middle of March. And I think that's really going to kind of set the stage for the rest of the year. Then I'll be able to determine, uh, are we really going to hit these numbers or are we going to be held back for the rest of the year? Uh, going five years down the road, I'm looking at um, for the price minimal triple, if not quadrupling by 2025. Um, this is now going assuming robo taxis are actually going to be uh, become a thing. Uh, for me, I'm playing it out as 2024, we may see robo taxis probably in China first. 
They have uh, robo taxis already over there. So if robo taxis become a thing in China and then start to get regulated here in the U.S. at least in a few states by 2025, we'll see a quadrupling of the uh, the stock price. We'll probably see four four thousand, if not more, by the end of 2025. And then 2030, 2032. I mean, there's so much going on for Tesla. You know, so many people refer to it as the best ETF, and the way I look at it is they are potentially going to be the best ETF ever. We're not there yet. There's still so many things they have to actually make happen to get there, but Elon makes things happen. So I have high confidence in that happening and seeing uh, you know, the Tesla bot becoming a reality, uh, at least helping in the factories over the next five years. And then by 2030, 2032, that actually becoming a reality in other people's factories and people buying them to help improve their own uh, logistics, their efficiency with operations, um, just everything that they can do in manufacturing. And then if they do start getting into people's homes, forget about it. I mean, that S curve is going to skyrocket and keep going forever. Yeah, definitely agree with you. We've got some pretty huge catalysts coming up. Um, I would, I would agree. I think, you know, full self driving and the, the robo taxis is uh, going to be the biggest game changer just because it's going to, this is really the first time in history, you're going to have an asset that the value and what it's capable of just, overnight the switch will flip and it's the possibilities there are going to be endless and uh i think they could use a lot of that money to just fund whatever they want to do from there you know with the ai oh, and yeah. robotics it's uh we can't even quantify really oh so it's crazy because like right now i've got my model y on order so when that comes in then i'm waiting for my cyber truck and my thought was i probably won't see the cyber truck till 2025 which is fine by me and i would have traded in my model y but if i can now take my model y and have it make money for me there's no point in trading it in. I'll just let that thing go and work for me all day long. And so when, you know, Elon's talking about a $25,000 car, you know, not even being a thought on the radar right now, which it is. So I know it's coming, but reality is that what's the point? I think they're going to end up coming out with two versions of it, one without a steering wheel and pedals. So it's going to be a straight robo taxi and then another version for people to actually purchase. Um, so just seeing those things coming along, you know, why would I not want to take my car and set it out there to make me money? But yeah, RoboTax is going to be such a huge uh, revenue stream for them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was really just that last earnings call that it just got such a mixed response. And, you know, my first listen through like the couple hours after I was even a little like, all right, like we're doing what now with these, uh, with the robots, <laughs> but you know, these things like, I can't even think like Elon. So it took me a couple of weeks to process. And then I'm like, holy crap. Like I, it made perfect sense to me. And especially that they are, um, you know, putting such a, a immense focus on the full self-driving and people were annoyed that, you know, they thought we were going to get the, the 25 K car sooner and the cyber truck, but it makes perfect sense. You know, they, they can get as much market share with the uh, SE S3 and X and Y, you know, focus on just as uh, gobbling up market share and the value that they will create with FSD will dwarf anything in comparison. So it makes the most sense, I think, to, to go all in in that regard. Um, and the yeah, like you said, I think that these things we're going to see eventually, there's really no no point in rushing them out right now. And, and they even said if they were to rush and create the cyber truck and the compact car right now, it would lead to them selling less vehicles overall. So their their goal is just grab as much of the market share as they can. Um, so I, I think it all makes pretty clear, crystal clear sense and just people haven't really processed it entirely. Oh, yeah. And one of the things I look at with Elon and, and I, I like to try and look at people as, as they are. And Elon says, you don't need to read between the lines. You just need to read the lines. So I, I altered when he said that I altered my whole valuation model to what are they saying? My base model is literally what is Tesla telling us? And that's it. And, you know, when Elon, you know, you go back over the years and one of the reasons why for me, it didn't hit me like it hit most everybody else was, you know, you learn Elon, you learn Tesla and how they talk about things on earnings calls. And they're always talking about things two to five years down the road. So like, that's where their mindset is. So they talk about where their mindset is, but you have to remember that they're still currently working on everything that they had talked about from two years ago. So it's not like they're kicking their, their whole EV, you know, business off to the other side to work on the Tesla bot. No, no, no. They, they're just comfortable enough where the EV market is and their EV business is to continue going comfortably there. And then they can go focus elsewhere. So, you know, and that's why 
when and then I hear people talking about, you know, well, competition, this and that. And I go, well, they're now setting the foundation for themselves to not have to worry about competition. They're already beating their competition. That's not even a question. But if just in case GM and Ford happen to come up and come up with magical EVs that match Tesla's, Tesla's already working on the next thing. They've got FSD. They've got the Tesla bot, which their competition does not. Yeah, definitely agree. And uh, it's just so funny. I was, you know, reading through some stuff today, just showing for the last five, eight years, you you got these headlines, you know, GM can squash Tesla this year if they want to, the, this Tesla killer, that Tesla killer. And it's just like comical at this point when you see that, you know, GM and Ford come out. I think uh, GM's goal is to be 100% electric by 2035 and, and Ford oh, yeah. 40% by 2030. I mean, there's no hope, <laughs> no hope no, for and, them, I think. <laughs> and I'm like, and I look at the fact that I was like, you know, kudos to them. I'm all for green across the world. So, you know, I... I actually want them to succeed, um, at least in the short term, because then this way the whole world will start to transition to EVs. And you know, looking at human psychology, uh, once we get to the point where people stop saying, I'm gonna go buy an EV versus a, an ICE vehicle, and they just say, I'm gonna go buy a car, and that car is an EV, that's when we know we've made the turn. Um, but you know, when GM and Ford are putting out their, their projections and their projections are falling short of where Tesla is now, for 2025, I'm like, how are you going to beat Tesla with projections that are falling short for three years? You just, you can't do it. So I, I don't know. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I don't know if they're going to go bankrupt just because they'll probably get enough government funding to make sure they don't like they have in the past. But, you know, there's a whole lot of other things going on in the works right now with the Russia, Ukraine that could potentially push us faster in that direction. And if these legacy automotive makers can't keep up with it, they're going to be gone sooner than we think. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, perfect transition to that topic, I think, uh, needs to be talked about. Obviously, a, a horrible situation we're seeing unfold in Ukraine. Um, I mean, do you think that this will, I'm hoping if we can find like any silver lining here that maybe it fast tracks the EU transition off of this dependency on the Russian oil. I mean, they're already very environmental conscious, obviously, and maybe this this does help, you know, EV adoption, uh, do you think that, and, and solar, just sustainability in general, could you see something like that happening quicker now? Oh, yeah, actually, that's something I've been talking uh, about on my channel over the last week is just that, is looking at, you know, we're cutting off Russia from everything, you know, and there's a huge EU dependence on natural gas and oil coming out of Russia. So we're cutting it off. So now the EU is going to have no choice but to live without it, figure out how to survive without this. And that's going to kind of, you know, force them into this. You know, Elon's already helping with Starlink over there in Ukraine, which is awesome. So now if we can start looking at, all right, well, what are these alternate, you know, forms of energy? We'll get solar put up there. We get battery packs put up there. And regardless of who helps them, that's what's going to help transition the world. We're going to see this. We're going to see it going. Once we start to see how it actually functions in the EU, it'll really push the rest of the world to go there even faster when they're all of a sudden like, we don't need oil. Gas prices are coming down like crazy. And the fact that gas prices are going up as high as they are is just going to encourage people here in the U.S. to buy more EVs. Think about, you know, right now, cars across the whole entire country are depleted. There's like nothing out there available. So everybody's producing EVs and ICE vehicles at the same time. So when you're going out there to purchase one of these two, you're going to have your option of both. And your lead time is going to be the same for them both. So which one are you going to choose? The EV that's going to cost you maybe a little bit more up front, but you're not going to have to pay for gas or the gas vehicle, which is going to cost you a lot of gas. You know, and people will have that decision to make. And I have a feeling we're going to pick EVs just because that's the positive sentiment. So despite the fact that there's so much FUD out there about everything in the world right now, there's still a lot of positive news coming out of EVs and green energy. Yeah, and definitely, and just to add on to that, I mean, when in, in Tesla's case, at least, when you add on to that, that, uh, you know, the cars are tending to hold their value much better, um, and that it could potentially be a, a cash flowing asset if the if the robo taxi stuff does pan out, um, it, it could be a great investment, you know, not only are you buying the best car, but it, it could be, you know, set you up long term. Um, I think there's a lot there. You know, it's funny, you say, something just clicked in my head, I'm almost wondering, like Elon talking about, you know, the, the compact car and going forward, I'm wondering because of the way he's talking about the cost of FSD, 
thinking about, you know, go back to old cell phone days. You go to buy, you know, get a cell phone, go down to AT&T and they say, hey, you know what? You sign yourself up for a two-year plan. Here's a cell phone for free. I wonder if Elon would ever get themselves to a point where they say, hey, you buy this FSD package for 150 grand, we'll give you the, the car for free. You know, that yeah. could be something that may actually play out. There's, yeah, there's definitely a lot of ways that they, they can uh, take advantage of it. And also just the, the possibilities to perhaps license out full self-driving to the other automakers who are, you know, just going to be maybe have some, some good EVs by that point. They're, they're not going to be able to do the FSD quickly. So that's a whole other revenue stream potentially for the company. Oh, yeah. And, and the part that stinks with that is, and I think it's going to depend on who is, who's in office at the time when that happens. But, you know, when it comes down to regulations, are they going to kick the regulation can down the road until, you know, these OEMs actually have a functional level four or level five autonomy vehicle just because they want to make sure it's a fair playing field? You know, we'll see how that goes. I think we've got enough positive catalyst behind us, especially with so many people talking about, you know, people dying in accidents and, and accident related deaths going way up. I think there's going to be a huge push for robo taxis to come out sooner than people think. Yeah, definitely. And it, you know, it's funny, I, uh, I was just in a restaurant last night, I overheard the people at the table across from us, where you know, they're having drinks, taking like shots and stuff. And uh, they were the one guy said something like, Oh, like, I wish I had one of those, uh, you know, Tesla with the full self driving or the, the autonomous driving, whatever he called it, to like drive me home tonight or something. And it's like, yeah, the, the application, as ridiculous as it sounds, I mean, not to encourage anyone to drink and, you know, go get in an FSD car. But I mean, I don't think people realize the magnitude and like revolution that this full self driving can really um, have an effect here. And just even beyond that, like, let's say you used to commute two hours, you know, an hour to work, an hour back every day, you get those two hours back now where you could do whatever you need to do, do the work that you would have had to wait until you got home to do or, you know, watch a movie, whatever it is. It's just, uh, I think there's, there's just so much potential with full self-driving. Oh yeah. And, and a big one for me. And, you know, I had said this, you know, years and years ago, thinking about, you know, getting out on the road and you see these old people driving, you know, people in their eighties and even in their nineties driving and they're driving slow, but you realize that they have places they have to get They're you know, they're still human. They need to get to doctor's appointments, get to the grocery store, the pharmacy, you know, if they were able to do this in a robo taxi, it would, you know, save a lot of people, you know, just the, the stress and hassle of, you know, they, you know, they don't want to be on the road either. So they can now be comfortable getting into a vehicle that's going to take them where they need to go and take them home and they'd be safe. They don't have to have that fear. Other people don't have to get frustrated about that being on the road or them, you know, getting into accidents. It's going to be a huge saver for a lot of people. Yeah, no, it's definitely a great point. There's, uh, there's just so many benefits of it. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, it's going to take time for people to, to really grasp it. Um, what do you see as the, the biggest threat to Tesla? Do you think anyone can catch up at this point? Or which company would you say is the closest? Uh, man, looking at it. So, you know, I, I listened to Ross Gerber and he loves Polestar. And Polestar is actually delivering vehicles. Um, so I actually bought a little GGPI just to, you know, kind of mon more to monitor them than anything because they're still considered a SPAC. So I really don't know what's going to happen with them because I don't know once they, you know, convert, if they're just going to drop below 10 bucks or what's going to happen. But, um, you know, I think, I think they're good. I don't know if there's any Tesla killers per se. The hard part is, is looking at both sides of the spectrum. You either have a startup or you've got the legacy OEMs. You know, the hard part about the startups is they don't have the capital behind them. They've got to do everything from scratch, but they have the benefit of not having ICE vehicles that are going to end up weighing them down and have to kick to the side. Legacy OEMs have the revenue streams coming in, but they've got a lot of debt and they've got a lot of ICE vehicle stuff that they now have to either get rid of or convert. And I don't think converting is going to work well. Now, looking at Fremont, that was a converted ICE factory. And so when you have a converted ICE factory, they can't produce as much out of that. So you have to build new. And a lot of OEMs are building new, but still taking down their old factories is going to cost them money. And they have a lot of debt. And, you know, when you have a lot of debt and a dying industry, it's, it's going to be tough. So I, I don't know if there's anybody there who can actually catch them. I think the Chinese automotive makers are the closest. Uh, BYD in China would probably be the best. Um, but I don't know. I think they said that they're going over to Europe soon. 
I know Neo actually has a factory popping up in California somewhere. So Neo coming to the US would be a huge one. Uh, but I don't know if any of them are going to come in. I mean, I've seen Sandy Murnau talking about how he thinks by 2030, China and Tesla will own the market in EVs. It's possible. Um, there's so much turbulence going on in China. Who knows what's going to happen there? But uh, I don't think anybody's going to take Tesla down. I think Tesla over the next 10 years is still going to hold uh, all the meat and potatoes and everybody else is just going to have the sides. Yeah, definitely. Lots of great points. Um, you know, I agree with you with, with Legacy. They, they've got a, a huge problem with the, the fact that they're so debt saddled and then you tag on to that, that in order to successfully make these EVs, they're cannibalizing their core business. Like they, they're not producing the EVs right now at a profit they're, and they're, they're hurting themselves because it's competing with their, their ICE cars. Um, yeah, like so Ford, Ford, for instance, they wanted to, you know, Jim Farley was talking about how he was going to separate, you know, the EV financials from the ICE financials and then said no. And it's because he realized that they're going to show so many negatives in the EVs. They don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. They're in, they're in a tough spot. Um, and then, yeah, it's funny you bring up Polestar. That's, that's one I've been looking at as well. I was thinking of buying some GGPI as well. Uh, I know Ross Gerber talks about that a lot. I just got to get around to doing some more research on it. I, I own some Neo. Um, bag holding that one a little bit i think my cost basis is like 38 and it's oh, you're, you're better than me at my mine's at 44 i was in <laughs> at 56 i actually so neo's another one i'm kicking myself for i bought that in the pandemic lows i bought it at two bucks and then sold it at four and because i just wasn't sure there's was too much uncertainty at the time mm -hmm. oh man some that just got away yep i i did the same thing i, I think i got into neo originally at three dollars maybe bought some more at six and i sold at like 18 then it went all the way to 65 and uh oh yeah it's kicking myself too uh but uh yeah and i would agree with you i think that you know sandy monroe is the expert and i know he said that you know chinese evs are are probably the the biggest threat um but like you said i i can't see anyone dethroning the king i i think what we're gonna see is you know, a, a, the news makes a big, um, big stink of like Tesla losing EV market share. But I think what we need to remember is that we shouldn't be only looking at EV market. It's just the total, the total car market of 70 million cars or whatever it is. You know, it, it doesn't have to be EV versus EV. It's really just EVs inevitably are going to be beating out these, these ICE vehicles. So the, the runway for growth for all of them extends so far. Like there's really... Oh yeah, I think there's plenty of room for for all of them. Um, I think Tesla will have the, if not the majority, the biggest um, chunk of the market share. You know, five ten years from now. Um, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, look at and that's that's the way I've looked at it right from the beginning. Was it's not EVs versus EVs. So there's no EV competition that's against each other. It's EVs versus ICE, and that's why for Legacy Auto it's so difficult because they're basically competing against themselves. And, and the hard part for them, and that's why in the U.S. it's such a struggle for them because of the dealerships, because in order for them to push their EVs the way they want to, they're going to undermine every single one of their dealerships, because all their dealerships make all of their money off of um, service, service and parts, and they make nothing on their vehicles, and if they're going to lose their service and parts, then they're, they're going to have a lot of dealerships going under. And the UAW doesn't like that because that's a lot of jobs lost. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's going to be a, a very difficult transition for all of them to go through. Yeah, they're uh, yeah definitely facing tons of hurdles. I was going to mention the, the UAW too. You know, they're not really totally on board with the EV transition. They want it to be slow because, like you said, it's, it's going to cost jobs. Um, so they really have a, a lot of hoops they're going to have to jump through. And it's going to take nothing short of a miracle, I think, for them. I wouldn't be surprised to see more, more bailouts, as you had said. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's scary because, like, you know, not to dive too much into the corruption of it, but, you know, obviously we've seen it. You know, the UAW, the Biden administration, it's, it's blatantly obvious that it's there. Um, but you have to remember that, you know, unions have a place. And, and I think a lot of them serve a great purpose. And initially, they were brought up for a good reason, um, you know, to protect the workers. But we have enough legislation in place right now that protects workers as it is. So, you know, you go look to what un unions really are, and they are a business. So they've got to run their business as is, and they're always trying to show growth as well. So looking at the UAW is now in a situation where they're going to basically go under. They're, they're going to not have a function or a need anymore. They're scrambling for whatever they can for survival at this point. 
And, and it's sad because, you know, what they're striving for is not for what's the best of humanity or the, the current even working population. You know, you're looking at, you know, Tesla pays its workers better than GM does. And GM is unionized, obviously. So are, is the UAW really helping workers or not? You know, Tesla is creating more jobs than GM or Ford are. So, you know, and that's obviously why the UAW is pushing so hard to get Tesla to unionize because they need that in order for them to survive. But what would be the point of Tesla unionizing if all they're going to do is actually create worse uh, working uh, atmospheres for their employees? Makes no sense. Yeah, no, you definitely hit the nail right on the head. And, you know, Tesla has proven that their uh, compensation and, and health care and everything is at least equal, if not better, to the um, you know packages that the uh, companies using the UAW are able to provide. Um, so it really would only work to slow Tesla down, which obviously Elon Musk has zero interest in. Um, but yeah, it's it's the reality of the situation is tough because yeah, like while you know it was great in the beginning and they the 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 idea of unions is great in the you know modern workplace, like you said, there are probably enough protections and. It's, it's just another thing that's that's going to hold back those uh, legacy autos from making the uh, a drastic transition to electric vehicles at this point. Yeah. And, and you know, I've talked to a lot of people who are, are pro-union. And again, I have no problems with unions whatsoever. Um, but, you know, they're like, we're going to lose jobs. And I go, you got to think back to, you know, even when the, the car was first invented, you know, people who were, you know, maybe worked on wagons and things. It's not that they were losing their job or that jobs were going to go away. It's just a transition of the type of job. So now people are going to have to learn a different type of engineering when it comes to uh, vehicles. If you want to get into automotive, you have to learn about EVs now versus learning about ICE vehicles. The jobs are going to be there. They're just going to be different types of jobs. Right. Yeah. And this, uh, I, have you watched uh, the documentary, um, Who Killed the Electric Car? No, I have not seen that. So I actually, I had heard of it. I, I, I finally got around to it earlier today. I watched it. It's, uh, it's actually on Prime Video. It's like an hour and a half. Highly recommend everyone checks that out. But it's very interesting because General Motors had an electric vehicle in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, people loved it. And maybe this is what Biden is talking about when he says that GM, you led the electrification. Uh, they had a great electric vehicle. It was, you know, going 90 miles uh, per charge about everyone loved it. And it was sandbag kind of, there was some corruption there. And it, it, I think it was a combination of GM realizing that this was going to destroy their core business. Oil companies obviously had um, a lot more power back then. It was just a combination of things. And it's tragic, but you know, I guess at the other end, here we are today, we've gotten this opportunity with Tesla. We may, Tesla may not have existed had GM actually gone through with this, but very interesting, True. and it, it just exposed all this corruption. Uh, you know, it's oh just, yeah, and just actually, crazy. And they actually reached out to every single owner and pulled every one of them back. There's only a few left yep. that are in museums, and all the rest of those have been destroyed. Like, yeah, no records that they even existed other than museums. I didn't realize that it's super interesting. They they purposely they only leased these out to people. They they weren't you know no one was able to buy them. So GM forcibly recalled them all and these people were like i want to keep this car like i love it so much it was like yeah. super advanced and and awesome for the times and uh they took them all and they put them in a scrapyard and crushed them it's just like unbelievable oh, yeah well and, and you're right and and i mean you think back then too obviously you know man that was before gas prices even skyrocketed but but you know obviously we know the corruption with oil and that's we're still dealing with it this day but there was also no and i don't even know how they would have done it because there was no infrastructure at all for it. We didn't have, I think, the means back then to even be able to do that with a charging infrastructure. I mean, our, our, our whole entire electrical grid is so foobarred as it is. Um, I mean, it's obviously worse now than it was back then, but at least now we have at least sustainable energy alternatives to go to versus what we had back then. So I don't even know if that would have survived or taken off just because that would have been a major challenge. Um, but it, it is sad to see the fact that you know, they had them, they were doing well, and they could have said, hey, these are great. Let's work on an infrastructure. Let's work on alternative energy. And they chose not to, because yeah. that would have taken away from oil. And yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, thankfully, some things have changed, but many have, many have stayed the same. 
Um, yeah. So I guess uh, regarding, so Tesla, are you, are you still buying more shares currently? And what's your buying strategy? Oh, yeah. So my buying strategy right now, and I, it's gone up, is um, every day I invest. I use SoFi for fractional trading. So I don't have the kind of money coming in to buy full shares. So I just put 15 bucks in every single day. And it's great because when the price comes down, I'm getting more shares. It's, it's yeah. awesome. And, uh, and so I do that. And then I was doing every percent it dropped. I would put in 15 bucks, but because it's been trading sideways for the most part, I decided to go every 2% or when it drops, you know, if I've, I was spending quite a, a lot around the 900 to 950 range. So I just held off and waited and I just bought a, a bit heavier when it dropped down to low 700s. So I'm, I'm definitely still adding, not even a question because I know it's going to split. I'm assuming still this year, unless something uh, major uh, halts that from happening. But um, we might actually, so my initial thought for it is it's going to split in November after the election, uh, which they would probably announce at the Q3 earnings call, but they might end up doing it again, same time this year that they did the first time. They might announce it in late July and have it go in August. And as, uh, um, I don't know if you watch Farzad, but he was talking about how they have the two different windows for time for employees to purchase. And one of them is in September, which is why I think they ended up doing the last one in August. Mm. Could do end up doing the same thing because looking at how the macro environment's going, we might end up seeing a bit of a bull run happen over the summer just because we'll have an idea of what's going on with Russia, Ukraine. We'll have an idea of what's going on with the interest rates going up. So there might be, you know, still uncertainty, but at least, you know, a clear line and clear path until we get to the midterm elections. So we might see it climb up. We might see that split happen in July and August and then go into the elections like we did last time because it happened right before the elections last time. Yeah, so, that, uh, uh, definitely would so, make sense. Yeah, so it, it could totally happen. Um, but I definitely see it happening. So I'm going to continue to add because obviously once it splits, it's just going to multiply whatever shares I've got. And that's what I want because I don't see this thing slowing down anytime soon. Yeah, and it'll uh, it'll be interesting. You know, let's say that gives them like, what are we in March now? A few months at least. Let's, let's say like six months from now. I mean, when all this stuff is hopefully blown over and we've got some more stability and some clar uh, clarity with the rate hikes. I think by that point too, you know, with, with Austin, Giga Austin and Berlin opening, hopefully, and pumping cars out. I mean, Tesla's lead by that point may just be so unassailable. Like they, they could do 1.5 million deliveries this year, maybe 2 million if, the, if those factories are really able to ramp quickly and then i mean the and then they just uh i don't know if it's like official yet or rumored that they're building another factory in shanghai like right next door what do you think of that yeah. so I, I believe that's actually i don't i don't know if it's still a rumor i think it's actually i don't know if anybody's actually confirmed it. i don't think tesla's confirmed it so i guess technically it's still a rumor but it sounds like it's pretty good and catl just opened up a second battery factory which is going to produce a ton of batteries for tesla there too which would go right, play right into the second Shanghai factory opening up as well. And so between those two, and you know, Shanghai is going to build that thing real fast and get that thing up and running. So thinking about, you know, just the timeline. So if we've got uh, Berlin opening up in the next couple of weeks, Austin opening up by the end of the month uh, of March. So you got the, both of those coming, then we're going to have the Q1 earnings call. So when you see the Q1 earnings call, and they're going to give us news about how Austin and Berlin are going to be doing. And if then analysts are going to see what the run rate is in Shanghai currently without the expansion, then it's going to be nuts because people are, you know, analysts haven't even increased their, you know, they've done it slightly, but they're still around the 1.3, 1.4 million mark. And that's where Tesla had said that they're going to be with just Shanghai and Fremont alone. So you tack on Austin and Berlin, you're going to have at least seven, eight, seven, eight months worth of production out of those two. You know, you're looking at, I'm still holding my 1.81 million production for the year mark, and they're going to sell literally everything that they produce. So I'm thinking that we're going to see Q1 earnings is going to do well. We're going to see a 30% margin. I think margins over the next two quarters are going to really show us because Elon's last tranche requires him to hit 30% margins four quarters in a row. So the next two, I think they're going to work some, some magic out to make that happen. And so we'll see margins at over 30 for the next two quarters. And then after that, once we see that 30% that margin, Elon hits his last tranche. And they're like, in the ramping phases of two different factories, Tesla still held a 30% margin. It's incredible. The, the whole the, the stock price is going to skyrocket. And at that point, they're going to announce a split. The price will go up again. And it'll, it'll look very similar to what it did last time when the stock just takes off. Yeah. Yeah, that... Uh... 
makes a lot of sense. I could definitely see that playing out. And it's interesting, you know, I've had some thoughts like, because, you know, it was rumored they were going to do the stock split. Uh, what was it like 12, nine or something? Everyone oh, yeah. thought, but I, I think it was good to wait because if they did another split, it would have, you know, skyrocketed the stock again. And it would have just, you know, let all the bears come out and say how overvalued it is and, and just made it worse. And I think it was smart to wait, but yeah, like by that point, it, uh, it would probably start making sense again. You know, if the stock starts, I mean, really the, nothing has changed when it hit its high of what, maybe 1250. I mean, if anything, the company's in a better position now than it was six months ago. Oh yeah. And it's, and it's trading at close to almost half that we got down to like what 700 was the low, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So 700 was crazy. And, and that hundred point swing in a day, just absolutely wild the last couple oh, of yeah. weeks. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, you know, had all this stuff not happened and, and the rate hike announcements and everything, I mean, it could very well have been up to 1500 by now. I mean, who even knows? <laughs> oh, yeah. And I mean, even at 1250, like I was still encouraging people, like if you want to buy, still buy. If you're going to be a long term investor, 1250 was still a great price. So anybody out there who did buy this at 12 or 1250, just hold tight. You're going to be fine long term as long as you're a long term investor. Um, totally worth it. Um, if you can dollar cost average, do so, bring it down. It'll just make your life a lot less stressful uh, if you're watching the market every day. But, uh, but I didn't think 12.9 was really going to happen. I knew it was speculated. Knowing that Elon was going through his sales, you wouldn't split a stock at that point. It wouldn't make sense um, because he knew when all of his uh, sales were going to go through. So there was no, no point in doing a split back then. Um, and I, I even thought, you know, even at 1200, I thought the price was high, you know, it's still worth buying for long term, but you know, it was definitely overbought for sure. You know, there's so much euphoria that runs into Tesla, but that's why, you know, when it comes to emotions and the way the stock swings, buying on the downswings is great because it always swings further than it should in both directions. And you got to pay attention to that as an investor. But, you know, when you're swinging high, if you are going to be a trader, and for me, I'm practicing that in my IRA. And that thing is euphorically running high. If you are going to trade, sell it because it's totally swinging way higher than it should. And then when it comes down, it's going to swing a lot lower than it should. And that's a great time to buy back in. So I don't know if another split will slow that down. It might. Um, I was. Uh, I know that they might do some some share buybacks, but that can't happen until they hit investor grade level for credit. Um, hopefully that happens too, because that's another big one that's on the radar that a lot of people seem to forget about is uh, is the credit rating. Because as soon as they hit that, then an institutions can start buying up on it. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of institutions that literally will not purchase a stock, regardless of how good it is, unless it's investor grade. And so, you know, if, if we're going to be looking at them becoming investor grade, I don't even know how many institutions out there are like that, but I know they're going to start dumping money in. And that, yeah. that might happen over the next few months. Yeah, definitely. Lots of, lots of positives. I think we're going to be yeah. seeing the next, over the next, you know, six, 12 months here. Um, I guess uh, I, so I'd seen this quote. I, I don't know if it's confirmed or not from Joseph Yuval, the uh, he's the senior en engineering manager at Tesla saying that 2022 is going to be the year of Tesla energy. What do you think? I, I know that this segment they've been kind of saying for years, do you think we'll see it start taking off? I mean, because I think that's a whole whole other industry of a huge potential too. Oh, absolutely. And especially looking at, you know, what's going on in the EU, um, you know, they're going to pump that out. And it was crazy because energy has been flying under the radar so hard. You know, the whole solar thing was never really doing much. It's more of the energy backup. That's why one of the reasons I own Enphase as well. But Tesla with it, you know, just hearing about how these mega pack factories are just magically popping up that nobody knows about. They talk about factories that are that they're running that nobody knows, like the one in Nevada. They've got one in California that's popping up. Like one of my subscribers was like, hey, I just happen to be driving down the road and I see them starting up a new factory for mega packs. I'm like, OK. And then they've got the one in Texas that they're they're starting up. So these are like little secrets that are coming up. And I always like to take those things that, that executives from Tesla say put them in my back pocket because I'm like, they know what's going on. Just like when they talked about Tesla insurance back on the Q3 earnings call. They they know what's going on. They've got things working in these directions. I've got I've got faith in them. Yeah, definitely. It's uh it's only a matter of time until, you know, the the use case for that. I mean, I know they've done a lot helping out people in Australia where they've got all kinds of, you know, power and energy crises and crises and uh, you know, power outages. 
uh, it's just working wonders. And, and that's a whole other, whole other industry that they are just oh, yeah. ready. Like to I'm looking at it from with. like, I'm going to start investing in real estate. And in doing so, part of my plan is going to have all the houses that I own, multifamily homes are going to have solar on them. They're going to have Tesla power walls, you know, to help out the tenants because I want to do what I can do uh, to help them out. So having that, and that's just from a small perspective, looking at how Elon and Tesla are already looking at, you know, powering entire towns. You know, they're in Texas right now. We know that all the energy issues they went through when the storms came through, you know, what can they do to back themselves up? And they're going to have, in, you know, entire communities and towns are going to be built around these power walls. And once these towns start to see that, it's going to expand uh, dramatically. It's going to get crazy, especially once they start to build their own underground infrastructure with everything that ties to itself. That's really where it's going to start to take off. Definitely. Yeah. Lots of exciting things coming up uh, for Tesla here. Anything else you want to uh, close out with? Where can people uh, find you or contact you? Yeah, you can hit me up on my YouTube channel, Oracle Investments. I'm also on Twitter at Oracle Tim One. Uh, follow me there. Put out all the latest Tesla news uh, and all of my daily trades there as well. Awesome. I'll definitely link to those too in the description below. Well, thanks for doing this. This was uh, a lot of fun. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Vinny. I appreciate it. All righty. See you guys next time.